Abuju, Mayagan Gijik and Dishnikaz, Mayagan and Dudem. Welcome everybody to the University of Winnipeg Waimini Lecture Series. Um, the title of today's webinar is Intersections of Critical Race, Place, and Culture Within Our Current Climate. My name is Lorena Fontaine, and I'm the Indigenous Academic Lead at the University of Winnipeg. The University of Winnipeg is located on the ancestral lands on ancestral lands on Treaty One territory. These lands are the heartland of the Métis people. We also acknowledge that our water is sourced from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. The Waywini Lecture Series was established by the Canoe family in memory of the late Dr. Tobasanaquat Canoe. Tobasanaquat was a respected Anishinaabe leader, an elder, teacher, healer, honorary degree recipient, and was very committed to the University of Winnipeg community, as well as promoting the rich intellectual life of Indigenous peoples. Toba Sonequet's vision was to bring the best and the brightest to the University of Winnipeg, students, faculty, and public to discuss topics that are important to Indigenous peoples. The Way Winnie Lecture Series was established with the spirit of caring for promoting the intellectual life of Indigenous peoples, and we have so many brilliant Indigenous peoples in our communities, and this series is a way for us to celebrate that. Each year, I have the honour of working with the University of Winnipeg Waywini Committee, and I'd like to acknowledge our committee this year, uh, Dr. Julie Peltier, Dr. Mary Jane McCallum, Karen Froman, Dr. Jamie Cedro, Dr. Paul de Bisquale, Darren Crescheen, and of course, Dr. Julie Nagam, who is our moderator today. Uh, Dr. N Nagam is an associate professor at the University of Winnipeg, Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Arts, Collaboration and Digital Media. I would like to now call on Dr. Julie Nagam to introduce our distinguished panelists. Thanks, Lorena. Thanks for having me. Of course, it's always a pleasure and excitement to uh, to be situated here in Treaty One territory in the heartland of the Métis Nation, and um, you know, I, I guess we're never leaving because uh, apparently the vaccine is just never coming. So uh, I'm excited to host another Way One A talk series, and today's focus is just what Lorena said: intersections of critical race, place, and culture within our current climate. We have this incredible lineup of people who are friends and colleagues. I'm going to start with Dr. Mashana Goman, who's an associate professor of gender studies. Chair of American Indian Studies and Affiliated Faculty of Critical Race Studies in the Law School. She is also the inaugural Special Advisor to the Chancellor of Native American and Indigenous Affairs at UCLA. She is the author of Mark My Words, Native Women Mapping Our Nations, and the forthcoming book, Settler Aesthetics and the Spectacle of Originary Moments, Terence Malklick and the New World. Next up, we have Dr. Ronak Kapat. Uh oh, Kapata, who is the Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Studies in Gender and Women's Studies program at the University of Illinois at Chicago. His first book, Insurgents Aesthetics, Security and the Queer Life of the Forever War, won the 2020 Surveillance Studies Network Book Award. And his new book project, Breathing in Brown Queer Commons, examines race, radical, queer, and trans migrant futures to develop a critical the theory of healing, justice, and pleasure across transnational sites of security, terror, and the war in the wilds of ecology chaos and U.S. imperial decline. Tasha Spillett Sunder is a new mother, and hopefully we might get to see the little one. I know I've been watching her on Instagram. She's a celebrated educator, author, poet, and emerging scholar. Tasha is most heart-tied heart to the contributing community-led work that centers land and water defense and the protection of Indigenous women and girls. In her work as a doctoral candidate, she is weaving together her cultural identity and commitment to community to produce a body of research that amplifies Indigenous women's demands for justice, for missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited people, and serves as a continuation of the resistance against the assault of colonialism. Next, we have Dr. Jenny Wills, who is the author of Older Sister, Not Necessarily Related. It won the 2019 Hillary Western Writers Trust Nonfiction Prize and the 2020 Eileen McTavish Skype's Best First Book Prize. It was a 2019 Globe and Mail Best Book and a 2019 CBC 
best in Canada nonfiction choice and was named as, and most importantly, was named one of the 10 best Manitoban authored books of the last decade by the Winnipeg Free Press. She is the Chancellor Research Chair at the University of Winnipeg here, and she is an Associate Professor of English. And last but not least is Dr. Heather Agulliarte, who is the University Research Chair in Indigenous Circumpolar Arts at Concordia University in Jojagi, Montreal, and is Special Advisor to the Provost Advancing Indigenous Knowledges. She is also our Indigenous Scholar in Residence here at the University of Winnipeg. She leads the Inuit Futures and Art Leadership Shirk Partnership Grant and co directs the Indigenous Futures Research Lab. Aguliorte has been a curator for over 14 years and her most recent co-curated project is here in Winnipeg, is Inua at the inaugural exhibition of the Inuit Arts Centre, Hamayuk, which is hopefully opening next month, which we are all excited to witness. Our stories and connection to place define who we are and the politics within those histories continue to haunt us. As racialized people, we continue to weave new narratives that locate the unseen or disregarded bodies into the forefront with strong voices that continue to battle systemic barriers. Our, our moment is so critical that as many institutions and structures have to catch up to the complexity of race, gender, and sexuality, as the status quo will not be acceptable and the tables have turned with the explosion of global politics of racialized bodies breaking out of the shackles that try to bind them. We see this happening at the global and local level within our newsfeed and social media. There is a political shift of the public removal of colonial and racist monuments, protests, black and indigenous lives matter, and in our collective history shifting that allows for mass amounts of the public to speak out about the injustices that we are facing from different communities across the planet. Each speaker will reflect on the important projects and cultural shifts in their cities and the history of places and the importance of telling stories that were excluded or silenced. We will reflect on the collapse of the old new war, world order, hopefully celebrate that at some point, sustained through ongoing fears and the objectification of the other, critically mapping the emergence of new and radical alternatives. Our speakers will consider acts of alliances through BIPOC gatherings, solidarity, creative interventions, and scholarship. Each speaker will discuss the ways in which the relationship between race, sexuality, culture, and their communities allow for transformation and change through their work of curatorial, literature, aesthetics, and artistic practices. Discussing diverse forms of scholarship, this talk will forge new possibilities for our collective anticipation of the new world with BIPOC voices leading the way. I want to invite each of the speaker to reflect on your scholarship and practice that you're currently working on. And I'm hoping that Tasha will start us off. Thank you um, for your warm um, invitation to us all for this conversation. And I do want to say the vaccine is coming and we will leave frozen Winnipeg at some point. So I'll put out there. And I also wanted to say how much of an honor it is to sit uh, and share space with you all. And I'm just hoping that you can all put a doctor on my name through osmosis throughout this conversation. I am climbing, climbing the mountain, but I'm still not there. So I would appreciate, <laughs> I would appreciate that. Um, so I am a doctoral candidate uh, through the University of Saskatchewan. I'm working um, on uh, better understanding how gender operates within Indigenous land-based education. And so for me, especially like Julie said, especially as a new mother, um, for me, this work has become, it started off as kind of being more theoretical. I wanted to understand how it is we can put our bodies back on the land, back on the land to pick up the knowledges that our ancestors have left there for us. But um, when I became a mother, it became completely visceral. It became completely... Um, uh, just the importance flourished in a way that I hadn't seen coming before. And so it is thinking about my daughter um, and how she had and her inherent rights as an Anishinaabeg, as an Inanawak person, as a Black person, to have her connection with the land affirmed at every step she take, whether it be on her home territory um, in Manitoba, whether it be in our urban setting, we live here in, in Winnipeg, or eventually if we are able to make that trip to the continent um, of Africa through my own paternal ancestry, that she have her relationship to the land 
and be affirmed and celebrated and free from any any gender based violences that we know keep people keep our bodies away from having active and full relationships with our land bases. Uh, it, I'm also a teacher. So before I became, um, before I went into my doctoral studies, I, I did work in the K-12 school system previously. And as a teacher, an English teacher, uh, it became really, really apparent to me how uh, how important it is to move scholarship, to mobilize scholarship in a way that is accessible for all of our relatives. And so outside of my academic work, I also publish um, graphic novels, YA graphic novels and children's books. And so the work that I'm doing right now, actually the work that I'm more excited about rather than doing my data collection and analysis is writing graphic novels that we know um, can access way more, way more of our community members and young people that that talk about the importance of putting our bodies back on the land and taking away any, you know, colonial, colonial steeped oppression that keeps our bodies away from the land. So we know that here, in, I'll give you an example, uh, here in, in Manitoba, you know, and an aspect of gender-based violence that we see is people being uh, being kind of forced to adhere to certain protocols around how they can access ceremony, how they can access land, land knowledge, uh, in a way that we know separates people, very vulnerable people, our own people. And so it's so important to me uh, as a relative that in all of our in all of our circles and academia and outside in our cultural context that we break down, that we pull away all those layers of colonialism that keep us from being in relationship with one another and being in full relationship with the land. So that's where I'm at and I look forward to this conversation and to talking with all of you. I go say. Thanks, Tasha. I think we'll um, lean over to Ronak to tell us a little bit about some of his work. Thank you, Dr. Nagum, and thank you, soon to be Dr. Spillett. It's uh, great to be in communion with you all. And greetings, everyone. I'm joining you from the great indoors on the northwest side of the city of Chicago on the ancestral lands of the Council of Three Fires, um, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Odawa nations. Um, and, you know, being in this panel together, I'm reminded that. A land acknowledgement, especially by non-native people of color like myself, is not just some rhetorical gesture, but instead the animating force and material ground from which any critique of violence and imperialism and war that we forward here today is possible. It's also over my recognition that as a queer cultural theorist of late modern US wars in the greater Middle East region, with a focus on Arab, Muslim, and South Asian diasporas, that the entire economic, cultural, and political apparatus that's shaped and directed practices of global settler colonialism and white supremacy that continues to wage wars on indigenous peoples are the very dynamics that we're here to discuss and dismantle. Um, so in my work, I'm particularly interested in the role of emotion, affect, and feelings in insurgent politics and resistance. So I try to attend to the minoritarian body and its sensory states as a way of understanding US geopolitics, US global state violence and contemporary war making as well as its un insurgent undoing. I think it's crucial to recall that our senses are vital to any recruitment effort, effort and that reactivating our sensorium is central to offering not simply a diagnosis of all the horrors of the world today of which there are many but also to reimagine it all, including alternative models of subjectivity, collectivity, and power that will help us create the world that we wanna live in. So my goal in my work and all of my projects is to shift attention away from diagnoses of these dominant overlapping structures, not because they're unimportant or theoretically exhausted concepts, um, but because they're insufficient. Instead, I wanna spotlight the affective structures and aesthetic forms of resistance and reimagination that are found in racialized public cultures. And this explains my focus in my newer project that uh, Dr. Nega mentioned on queer and trans black indigenous people of color healing, pleasure and breath. Thinking about breathing in the brown queer commons in the face of so much overwhelming suffering and securitized state violence. Um, so my first book, which was published about a year ago is called Insurgent Aesthetics. And in that project, 
it tried to examine the queer world making potential of contemporary visual artists and multimedia artists in the context of US security wars in the greater Middle East with a focus on Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Palestine, as well as the domestic circuits of repression and surveillance in North America. Um, so Insurgent Aesthetics is about the creativity and fugitive beauty that emanate from the shadows of terrible violence incited by forever war making and the kind of critical knowledge projects of diasporic migrant and refugee people um, who are trying to make meaning out of these histories. Um, so that's what the first work was about. And so the first book tries to trace these kinds of insurgent responses to the state of emergency produced by fears of national security and the US's aggressive policing and surveillance apparatus. But my new work is trying to extend these questions on global racialization, on criminalization and aesthetics to consider the state of emergence among a new generation of social justice activists and queer and trans migrant BIPOC artists in North America. So I'm calling this book Breathing in the Brown Queer Commons. And I've been interested in the question of breath and breathing far before our global pandemic moment, uh, but it's taken on new residences certainly now. Um, and this project is about migrant futurisms. And so what I'm trying to do is examine the expressive cultures of contemporary movements and visual strategies of resistance against the militarization of urban police violence and the domestic war on terror across North America. So I'm asking how historical and contemporary forms of activism in queer and trans migrant communities of color have created new models of healing justice praxis across multiple sites of militarized security and war. And healing justice is an intersectional framework created by QT BIPOC activists to identify how people holistically respond to generational trauma and violence while generating collective practices that transform the consequences of their bodily oppression. So the project tries to spotlight queer and feminist and crip and trans of color led organizing and visual culture that's informed by overlapping protest movements from Asian migrant feminisms to Palestinian liberation to the black freedom movement to indigenous resurgence and disability justice struggles. And by analyzing these different forms of culture and activism, I'm, I'm hoping that this project will help us understand the links between social movements against mass incarceration, migrant hyper-policing, and the global war on terror, which is a term we don't hear very much anymore, but has become so saturated and, perme and permeates really every aspect of policing and security in, in the new world in North America. Um, so in the process, I'm hoping to you know, investigate these kinds of culturally grounded systems of QT BIPOC care, support and wellness and what that can teach us about more broadly about embodied vulnerability, about insurgent futures, about the intimacies of racialized and sexualized bodies in light of all of the immense ecological and political economic transformations um, that face us in the dystopian here and now. Um, there's much more to say, especially about how the black and brown Midwest has become an epicenter for these forms of insurgent rebellion, but I'll leave that for um, our discussion and, and pass it on. Thanks, Ronak. Um, Heather, did you want to uh, tell us a little bit about some of your work? Absolutely. I mean, I don't necessarily want to follow Ronak, but I will do my best <laughs> to try. That was fantastic. Thank you. Unasakut, uh, Dr. Heather Glulupti, I'm, I'm here um, also on Treaty One territory right now in the homeland of the Métis Nation. I am visiting Winnipeg. I got special permission from Concordia University to be here and it's been fantastic. We just lifted lockdown the, the strictest part just last week so that's pretty great and uh, I am here because I'm working on Kamayuk which is the new Inuit Art Center at the Winnipeg Art Gallery and Inua which is the exhibition that I'm co-curating with my uh, three co-curators Asinayuk, Kablusiak and Krista uluk Zawatsky. And uh, I'm just sitting here and reflecting on <laughs> what we're doing and, and what I'm gonna say. And I feel like we're, uh, just yesterday or two days ago, our colleague, Dr. Serena Keshevji came in to, uh, to get a little sneak peek of the exhibition coming together. And she said, she was saying like, Heather, you're gonna blow the roof off of everything <laughs> right now. And sometimes when you're in the middle of install and it's like an eight week install, you kind of get lost in the little details. And then just being able to take a step back and reflect on everything we're doing, like we really are, um, trying to break down everything that I don't like about the field of Inuit art, all the stereotypes from Southern Canada and to, um, and the ideas and sort of old notions, of primitivism and uh, the sort of constraints on what Inuit art can be and how 
the imposition of, you know, um, missionary evangelization, how that still weighs on our communities. And so we're just, uh, I'm really, really proud of the work that we've all been collectively doing. We have, um, it is, I think the queerest Inuit art exhibition, at least openly queer Inuit art exhibition that has ever been. We've got a huge number of LGBTQ2S artists included in the show. We have um, Inuit who are not just Inuit and white, which is what I am, but, and, and of course the vast majority of Inuit who are of mixed ancestry. Um, but, you know, there are Inuit, Haitian, Taino artists in the show and uh, Black and Inuit artists, um, students who are working behind the scenes on the project with us as well. We're also, we're kind of doing away with primitivism all at once and like, and introducing uh, new genres, I think, to, that will surprise people. There's a lot of installation art and video, sound art, um, things that are going to be, you know, different for a lot of people when you think about Inuit art, you think about sculpture and prints and drawings and so on. Uh, we've got um, elders mixed in with emerging artists and youth and uh, every kind of medium that you can imagine. So I'm, I'm really excited about the work that we're doing because it is really, I hope, going to set a new bar in uh, what's happening in my field. I think that's all I need to say right now. This is all I can think about because like I'm, I was at install yesterday. I'll probably be back there later on this afternoon. So that's like, I'm very, I'm very immersed right now. It's probably all I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> Not gonna be I think that's okay. I mean, there's lots of projects on the go. Um, Jenny, did you want to take a shot at it? Sure, thank you so much. Um, thanks, Lorena and Julie. Thank you, Ramona, for all of the support here. Um, and I'm so grateful to be speaking alongside all these amazing panelists who, um, of whom I'm a huge fan. Um, I'm also zooming in from Treaty One territory. Um, and, and I thought a lot preparing for this conversation about what it means to teach race and ethnic studies as a settler of color here. And um, I'd also like to echo, I think, the importance of reiterating the triangular or polygonic, I don't know if that's the right word, um, sort of dynamics of multicultural settler colonialism and, um, and the ways that non-Indigenous POC have benefited from colonialism, have been weaponized as tools of colonialism, even in these acts of, um, of harm from dominant groups. Um, so, so as Julie mentioned early on, we were asked to reflect a bit on how collaborations and gestures within and across communities sort of shape the works that we're doing and I really struggled with this question because at some point I was like, okay, how do we, um, how do you put into words the thing you just do because you just do it, I guess. So, so I don't know if my co-panelists had that little dilemma or like that little existential <laughs> sort of panic moment, but I certainly did. Um, until I realized, I think I've already been thinking about this. And so, so I wonder if, if people will um, indulge me, if I can share a little bit of a reading of something that I wrote. Um, it was recently published in Room Magazine and it's called an epilogue of BIPOC love. And in it, I wanted to, um, I, I, I was writing an essay that was made up of little love vignettes, I think, to different um, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who have come to be a meaningful part of my life. So if you'll indulge me, there's a short introduction that explains why I'm doing it. And then maybe if there's time, I'll read like one of the little thingies. Does that sound okay? I can only see the co-panelists, but I'll just, um, I'll take their, in, their support. Back in 2008, I did my second bravest thing. And then I wrote what I hope was understood to be a love story about the Korean family I met as an adopted person in reunion. As many might have anticipated, our kinship has been complicated. Tenderness swollen with injury, forgiveness overcome with doubt, hope lighted by the eventual concession that is all too much for anyone to hold. It was so unfair. I placed all my desires onto people who were unprepared. They couldn't have known what had gathered inside me. They certainly couldn't have known what to do with it all. Of course, part of what I longed for was the literal biological kinship only they could offer. 
indefensible, illogical, hardcore love. A crooked bottom tooth, freckles, be positive blood, and the habitual flushing red after a glass of wine. But I was also looking for racial kinship, answers to the feelings of isolation and confusion I'd had growing up in a white family and community in Southern Ontario, Canada. I'd always read about marginalized young people who at least had the consolation that at home, the food feeds, the conversation attends, and the family unit is strong against racism and bigotry. Maybe if you think back, this speaks to your own childhood experiences. A parent to insist that kimchi is delicious, a sibling to prove that dark hair is in fact lovely, a grandparent to model a lifetime of audacity, courage, and pride. I was foolish. I thought I'd find a backlog of that relief in Korea. I thought my Korean family would settle the past for me. But South Korea is a racially homogenous country with only now small amounts of immigration. Naturally, my family there never once considered racial difference or distance, and that frustrated our relationship. I was so unfair. But something wondrous has happened in the time since that reunion. Various life and work decisions have revealed opportunities for racial connection that has changed everything. As a teacher, as a writer, as a member of a different family, probably few people understand, I've discovered kinship beyond my previous imagination. It's made of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who are some of the loves of my life. It's made of you. This kinship, I won't apologize for its beauty. I won't be ashamed of its beauty. I'll press it onto my skin. I'll twist it into my hair. This is my love note to a few of you. But as you know, as well as I, we are many. Um, and I'll just, if I can, read one tiny little vignette or example. If, and they're all anonymous. Um, they're in the third person. The essay part is in the second person. But here's one. She is absolutely starving for affection, for safety, for innocence. For me to look her in the eye, but sometimes I can't. She yearns so heedlessly for love that it makes me turn away. Not because I don't have it, love that is, but because I know that need, that appetite, and I've felt my own eyes hope wide in the face of another. I've known my own limbs pressed down beneath the heft of that glut. I've also seen her granite her face, hard girl stocked in shops, fists balled into hooded sweatshirt pocket. Hard girl who refuses small talk from that foolish person who just yesterday said some shit, but today overestimates her charm. Hard, hard girl who keeps hunger fastened beneath tongue so far back it sometimes explodes bitter behind clenched teeth. But she is softness too. I was like, thanks. That was awesome. I, it's like, it's so nice to like switch gears and especially as uh, like all of us kind of have creative uh, aspects or interested in art and uh, poetry and literature. And so it's like, it's such a treat, you know, and it's, uh, you know, we get so, uh, I, anyways, I do get so wrapped up in academic land that sometimes I forget the beauty of, of writing and the spoken word. Um, Ms. Shauna would be awesome to uh, get to hear from you. Well, back to that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I'm Ms. Shauna Goman. I'm Tanawanda Band of Seneca. I am, I, I come to you today from Tavangar, which is uh, Los Angeles. You got the map behind me, all in uh, Tamba language from the Gavrilino Tamba people. Um, and uh, today I thought I, I have multiple projects going on right now and my brain is kind of spinning from them because I got, I, I'm on a one year sabbatical so I'm trying to finish all kinds of things up. But I thought today given this talk that one of the things that I could just uh, think through with you is this article that I'm working on on sites of enclosure. And um, it's kind of extends some of my other work on colonial spatial violences. And in, in terms of sites of enclosure, I thought one of the things that I think of is in this is the way property logics 
the temporalities of Native people and also our relationships by categorizations of race are disrupting radical relationalities we could have to push us forward, not only in terms of the necessity for understanding how we all move through different spaces, but how we interact with each other, what are our accountabilities. So in this particular piece, and, and I, I'll just give you a little overview of what I'm doing. I'm always very concerned with colonial spatial violences, but also how do we relate? How do we go somewhere? Like, for instance, a lot of my work lately is how to be a guest on Tom the land, right? How do I become a guest and not the settler? How do I form relationships and accountability and reciprocity with those people? So for me, I, I always have these theory pieces, and this is the sites of enclosure, in which I, I'm kind of theorizing the way those spaces get disrupted through particularly ideas of settler uh, visualities, like the way that we actually see space and the way we see or feel space, as Ronick was talking about, makes us interact in particular ways, right? So a large part of my work has been disrupting the ways that we see space. This is the praxis part I see um, of my work where I do a lot of digital humanities projects lately. And so I'm gonna concentrate on a new digital humanities project I'm very excited about. Um, called uh, Centering Tribal Stories in, time, in Times of Disaster. I got to look at this. We went back and forth with the title so many times. Um, Centering Tribal Stories of Cultural Preservation in Difficult Times, because we didn't want to call it, because there's a long times of disaster since the US and Canada formed. So um, we didn't want to necessarily, we did difficult times and, and part of those difficult times are dealing with climate change and dealing with racial upheavals. So. In my more theoretical work, I'm thinking through the sites of enclosure. What is it that disrupts us? But also what, what pushes us past that as Native people in terms of survivance and thrivance, but also goes past that in how we, we can relate to people. So for me, that comes through a concept of embodied sovereignty. And um, I'm kind of working in creating a more uh, in-depth um, notion of embodied sovereignty. And in that, um, what I don't think has been discussed, I think embodied sovereignty has been used to start, you know, I, I use it in a couple pieces and, um, and, um, and that I've written recently. Um, but uh, I, I, I really felt the need to expand it a little more because in that way, it's not just self-identification. It's not, it's, it's not just like I moved through spaces at a, as a Tanawanda Seneca woman, right? And this carries with me things, but what does it mean to carry that knowledge with me? Particularly in terms of how to treat the environment or try to interact with other tribal peoples or interact even in the space of Los Angeles, interact with my black feminist colleagues and communities and the Latinx communities and the indigenous Latinx communities. What is all this? what does all this mean in terms of embodied sovereignty, which is not just about the self. Right now, I feel like sometimes in Native studies, it sticks with the individual, which is kind of a problematic sticking point. So for me, um, trying to develop embodied sovereignty that moves towards accountability and reciprocity in relationality becomes key in, in, in thinking really how does that embodied sovereignty work. And here I turn, actually, I, I think a lot about um, Haudenosaunee perspectives on, on what that means, right? Like, and, and uh, kind of uh, philosophies that are, are political philosophy, ways of being in the world philosophies. And I think early on, something that my uncle taught me, and I'm, I'm willing to expand on this earlier, uh, later in the conversation, um, but something my uncle taught me and something that I need to think needs to be considered with embodied sovereignty, which is he always, he always was, you know, I, I, when I went to college and I came back and was conveying knowledge back and forth with my, with my uncle about, you know, federal Indian law, because he would always give me this like native studies 101 lectures, like, and I was like, I've been through four years. I'm like, just did my depth exam as a PhD. And he's like 101 Indian law, you know, and, but just fine. And you got to let, you got to let him talk. Right. Um, <laughs> and it just goes on and on. And they're like, Michonne, and you know, and he was, you know, he was involved in the 60s, 70s movements too. So um, I love my uncle and we, we work on that, but I was thinking one of the things that stuck with me that he taught me that is far outside of academic 
like a, a, a traditional academic and basic knowledge that you're taught in your Indian 101 class or your law classes or any of those kind of classes is that he always told me, Mishana, it's not you protecting land sovereignty. And this came about with that discussion of Indian law. Land protects your sovereignty, right? And so it's, it's really shifted my thinking at that point, which has led to kind of a plethora of the work that I do and thinking about how land protects your sovereignty. And maybe we have it all mixed up in this kind of ways that we're, we're thinking of things. So when thinking about embodied sovereignty, I'm kind of pulling that in, but also thinking about it as not just um, sovereignty in terms of law, but as a liberation practice, but a liberation practice with one of accountability and responsibility. So that has led to a lot of the praxis work that I'm doing or what I see as more praxis, you can call it community engaged work, but I see it as praxis because it's not just engaged with communities that are native that I'm working with, but I really feel like tribal knowledge is necessary for all of us in our necessary to survival for everybody. So with that, I just have been thinking about the possibilities of doing digital humani humanities kind of work. And part of that comes about because you can center tribal voices, tribal voices like my uncles that reframe really the questions that we uh, we have been asking in Native studies for 20 years and not seeming to get to the point where people understand that it's necessary to listen to tribal voices, right? So I've been thinking about how to do that through centering tribal voices and tribal stories in particular, because I feel like stories are really at the heart of who we are. And I know this is common. This is also basic Native Studies 101, but sometimes I don't feel like we listen enough to tribal stories and those tribal stories our ancestors tell us, or we don't listen to them to reframe the conversations enough. Um, and with that, I also want to say artists, not just because Julie and Heather are here, but I do think artists like give us that vision for unthinking and reframing that kind of work that we're supposed to. They're imagining what we see. And here I think of Hel Helena uh, Maria Veramontes' work. It gives us the ability to peek uh, beyond the fences, right? We have to have a direction to go. And um, I feel like artists and literary writers and theorists, some can help us get there. But we, that can't stay in academia. It can't stay just in the book or the art. So we have to have ways of conveying like how to unpack that or how to, how to help people reframe with those particular stories too. So I feel like the centering of tribal voices with digital humanities is a must. Um, use of, <laughs> sorry, somebody started printing in here. <laughs> Um, use of uh, what, even though we center those tribal stories, there's a way that we can have that reciprocity and accountability in academia by using our academic research and our abilities and talents there in order to give back to that. And here I think of the ways often, you know, academia is kind of from um, it gets a bad rap and I, and I get it because trust me, I'm special advisor right now and I'm always picking up faculty messes and um, I get that, but there's also a way that, you know, in Haudenosaunee philosophies, we all have gifts and talents, right? And we need to use that for a greater good. Everybody has their own specific gifts and talents. So I think um, there could be a back and forth redirecting those flows back and forth are incredibly important to do. And also in terms of that, the public outreach that we can do through digital projects or a different kind of reframing and thinking about what are the gifts we all have to give, right? And how do we correlate that? That can be done in a digital humanities projects that I work on, whether it's Mapping Indigenous LA, which is a project out of Los Angeles. And I'll put this in the chat for everybody too. Or a recent project that um, has recently, we've recently been doing called Carrying Our Ancestors Home, which is a project looking at repatriation. Because even though NAGPRA has been stated and stated for over 30 years in the US, human remains are still not home. But also what it doesn't get discussed in this is the toll it takes on native communities, a toll it takes to return your ancestors home when you have to come up with ceremonies or uh, reinterment or the money, the financials or the emotional labor of this, it doesn't get talked about enough. So carrying our ancestors home is about centering that so people have a better understanding of why return of human remains is important to communities, which 
you know, apparently we have to convince people of that, it, but also the toll it takes on communities. So through the digital process, we're able to bring those conversations in together. We're able to see what is it that led to the led to the grave robbing and the collection of cultural artifacts, but we're also able, most importantly, to center those, those voices. So as part of that, we are developing um, a sub project of that is called uh, uh, gifting knowledges and that is centering tribal stories in this preservation of difficult times, which broadens the scope of repatriation and cultural heritage issues by providing a curriculum foregrounding of indigenous perspectives and collaboration. So we're going to we're working on creating uh, 10 modules with that curated by faculty across the UC system, particularly because we're concentrating in California because that's where we're, we're based. And we'll show how these issues are interwoven, thus contributing to a paradigm shift within the disciplines interested in and preservation, curation of landscapes and cultural sites. In inner, we're gonna do this as an interdisciplinary curriculum, which provides an understanding of land and heritage preservation that enable, will enable uh, generations of activists, lawyers, engineers, and academics to create a world we consider the needs of where we, we consider the needs of future generations and the knowledge of past generations. So in this, we look at, um, we, we, we think about how to enable and push forward this, this knowledge or break out of those sites of enclosure, which is the more theoretical work I do. So despite um, their expertise in interweaving cultural and natural resource protection and repatriation issues, tribal voices are often underrepresented in the classroom. And this is especially discouraging for students in disciplines such as anthropology, environmental science, engineering, public policy, law, medicine, gender studies, I could go on, um, which often intersect with cultural heritage and federal Indian law. So, we will, um, and this will be interviewing indigenous experts about their firsthand experience and engage with researchers and institutions on cultural and natural heritage considerations. Now, two of the, um, we have 10 proposed activities and the ones, I'll just read the titles. I will be working on land introductions, which is a series of podcasts for universities to have a land introduction, which is a part of an article that I've been working on to rethink the acknowledgement, not as an acknowledgement, but as an introduction to space and where we're at. Uh, Beth Middleton Rose will be working on navigating land repatriation and rematriation. Cliff Trofser will be doing health consequences for carrying ancestors home. And I will be doing, which is I, I'm in conversation right now with Heather, Julie, um, on artifacts, art, and present practices. How do those materials matter to our artists today? And uh, climate change and cultural heritage, uh, particularly working in Puerto Rico with Isabel Rivera Colazo out of UCSD and Wendy Teeter, who will be working on Caravanga, which is a place that is close to UCLA. And it's a, it's a largely a water project. And Keola Fox, who's protecting genomic data of indigenous communities. And we'll be working with SIBA, the California Indian Basket Weavers Association, thinking through preserving, promoting, and perpetuating a healthy environment for weavers and terminated and unrecognized tribes and the silences of repatriation around those issues with Mark Mensch de Leon. So this is a huge three-year grant that we're working on and I'm very excited about it. So I thought I would share that because a lot of this is about climate change, about changing policies, and also um, how do we begin to center those voices in those very important cultural heritage preservation and also support our, I, I, in this, I'm always trying to support the storytellers, which I feel are the artists and literary people. So that's my new work, kind of doing stuff. <laughs> I think it's like, it's so important. I mean, also it's fun to like hear how busy other people are. So I'm like, oh yeah, keep going, keep going. It makes me feel less bad. I, uh, I also just love the idea of like curated landscapes. Like when you said it, my brain just like started to get excited about what that could you know, start to look like or um, feel like, you know, and so, yeah, I think it's all super exciting. Uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm really humbled and honored to have all of you guys here. The work that you guys do is super incredible. And uh, it's just such a nice opportunity for the folks that, um, <laughs> I think I need a sabbatical after listening. That's awesome. <laughs>
<laughs> but I, I was just going to say, I think it's so important for folks at the University of Winnipeg to get to hear the important projects that you're doing. And I think that, you know, the, the first kind of question I think we could pick up on, which I know some of you have already touched on, is how do you see the kind of shift in the global climate affecting the work and research that you're currently doing? So, you know, as we're kind of like, uh, not only stuck in kind of a global pandemic, but we see all of a sudden there's uh, been a strong desire from institutions to all of a sudden just grab and pull voices that they didn't bother to listen to prior to, you know, all of the kind of global explosion that's kind of what's happening. But I also feel like, you know, how has it been affecting it? And it can be positive or negative or just meh. But I just, at the end of the day, I think it's really interesting to think about, you know, we're in this particular moment of a pandemic and there's been lots of things that have been happening never mind the kind of american uh political climate that's happened which obviously impacts uh, us here in canada but it also impacts the globe and so i think that it's kind of interesting to hear from you guys how that is or isn't affecting the current work that you're doing so i don't know who wants to start or if we just want to go back in in the same order but it's up to you guys Maybe I'll just jump on because I'm not quite sure when my baby will re-enter the scene. But, um, you know, uh, all the events that you've just listed, whether it be the pandemic and like, I know I'm totally like my baby rules my existence now, but I became a mother on March 3rd. And by March 9th, our city was completely under lockdown. So having become a mother uh, in such a particularly uh, particularly difficult time in 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 our world's history has has definitely shaped the work that I do but also as a black and indigenous person I'm um, seeing the the unique coming together but also in some ways the very painful pulling apart uh, between uh, the, the rise of black lives matter and the land back movement um, has been really interesting as well. So I'll just do a short reflection. Uh, earlier this summer when there was huge Black Lives Matter um, outpouring of support here in Winnipeg, you know, we saw thousands of people out masked up, of course, at the, at the legislature in support of Black Lives Matter. But then there was also some really painful, I guess, questionings from indigenous communities around where are all these people black and allied people when our young people go missing when our women and girls go missing when we're out on the same steps of the, our legislative assemblies asking for justice or uh, demanding justice for the stolen lives of our own relatives and so for as a black and indigenous person to see kind of like the um, resurgence of anti-black racism within my own community as well as this beautiful and important opportunity for two communities to come together and support one another and do uh, really amazing radical resistance work has really uh, shaped kind of my own um, writing as a as a creative writer but also my academic work and so in some ways um, in some ways you know when I had my daughter at the beginning of this at this pandemic, I had I was I was kind of um, sat in this pool of regret, like why am I having a baby now? But then I had a I had this kind of awareness that the world has literally been ending since the point of that it began, and that you know we recreate worlds each and every day in our children, in the work that we do, in our alliances with one another, in the communities that we create, in the futures that we imagine with one another. And so I am for the first time, which is odd, tremendously hopeful. And so I remember I did this very um, awkward national interview on a Canada Day of years past and the public broadcaster asked me like well aren't you hopeful about reconciliation and I said no I'm not hopeful and so um but having been in this time now I do feel a sense of hope because there is no other choice we don't have a choice but to be hopeful to imagine a future in which is worthy of our children and so I think um, I have tremendous gratitude for the people who are going above and beyond already taxed in many ways 
to create spaces in which we can imagine these futures and doing the hard work, the very um, cumbersome work of creating relatives, whether it be remaking those relationships in our communities or broadening our communities and reaching out to one another on, on lines of struggle as our communities have always done. Like these things are not new. I know, you know, um, my my mom, who's like an OG resistor, she always says, you know, you know, Tasha, this, you know, resistance work isn't like, it's a privilege. Resistance work is a privilege. You know, the work doesn't start with you and the work doesn't end with you. It's just our responsibility to carry it through the time that we're in now. And so I'm so grateful for people who are using their minds and their hearts and the spirits to do to do that. So I'll sort of share that much. And if um, a little human pops on the screen, it's probably my time to to log off. But until then, I will enjoy sharing space with you all. I go say. Your mom is OG. I love that analogy. I was just like, oh my God, yes, yes, yes. Um, I, I saw um, one of you guys are ready to roll. So I'll... I'll leave it to you. Well, I'll just, I'll pick you back on that to say, you know, um, first of all, Tasha, my, my birthday is March 2nd. So I have a feel of Pisces kinship already with your child. And um, um, yeah, much to say about all that. But, you know, uh, Julie, to your question about this moment and transformation, it makes me think about the concept of contradiction because, you know, we're seeing this efflorescence of all this extraordinary organizing and activism. And at least in the US context, discussions about abolition, both prison and police abolition are, are um, exploding in so many different terrains. And that's exciting and compelling um, and fantastic. But then just as Tasha has laid out, like there are all these cleavages that are coming to the surface too, right? So the questions about, uh, BLM versus MMIW or the migrant justice work and like how to think about these communities and struggles in relationship to each other is um, I think something to, to put on the table. Like the question about that Mashana was raising and I think Jenny as well in, in your discussion about love is about what is the notion of the commons? Oh, hi baby. Oh, let's, the, the baby is gonna be the, the center here for sure. But how to put the baby at the center, how to put that kind of you know sense of the commons that is about what, you know, in my project, I talk about sensuous affiliations, which are about non-blood-based forms of affiliation and kinship and family. Um, and so like even the concept of BIPOC, which is this like term, uh, or QT BIPOC, is, that's a coalitional category, right? It's a coalitional category, which means that it's people working across difference, just as in the women of color feminist way, right, um, are working together to try to work across their difference. So there are all these models. And I think those models are also deeply queer because they're again about non-blood, they're not about blood, right? They're about these other modes of affiliation and um, relationality um, that we wanna also name. So I, I lost my thread here, but something about the idea of co contradiction that you know, in this moment in which we have the pandemic and we have the emergence of global fascism and authoritarianism and, all, and the climate change and all of these other transformations, there's also all of these extraordinary forms of movement work happening sometimes, which of course has always been the case. There's always been um, black and native led rebellion against the dominant security order from 1492 to the present. That's not new, uh, but we are seeing a moment in which people are trying to think across difference in, in complicated ways. And so I, I, I'm motivated by that. I'm motivated by the, the forms of um, collaboration and collectivity that people are bringing across movements, which again, I think also to tie something else that Mashana said, it's like, why do artists and healers and activists matter? Because they're giving us radical imagination and speculative modes of thinking and that we need that kind of visionary work because that visionary work is about um, transforming the old orders as, as you put it, Julie. So um, a plug for art, a plug for creativity, but also for a notion of the commons being reborn. I was just gonna ask Ronan, if you wanna talk even a little bit about the climate in Chicago, cause you guys have, yeah. you know, it's it's been slightly, I mean, not to put you on the spot, but just like it, it has a, you know, you guys are going through some different aspects of where we are kind of geographically too, right? Totally. Well, you know, I think Chicago is at the epicenter of a certain new strand of insurgent rebellion from uh, the, all the incredible black queer feminist organizing that's happening in our city um, to um, you know Red Nation Chicago, to the Arab and Muslim and Palestinian organizing that's happening in Chicago. There are all of these different sort of subsections of movement work that are happening in Chicago. And I think this is sort of an under articulated or understudied 
dimension of the way that the black and brown Midwest has become an epicenter of certain transformations around security and militarism and the domestic and the sort of militarization of policing in the United States. So everything from the police killing of George, George Floyd in Minneapolis to the police shooting of Jacob Blake to the ongoing organizing that's happening that was in Kenosha, Wisconsin to the extraordinary organizing that's happening in Chicago for the last several years, you know, black and brown Midwesterners are both the sort of laboratory of experimentation and creativity around forms of collaboration and movement work, but they're also um, the site of extraordinary experimentation by the state and it's, you know, death making apparatus as well. And so I think that there's that twin dimension that we need to pay attention. I think it's also recognition that we need more substantive reckoning with the specific maneuvers of racial capitalism. So things like predatory government regulation or post-industrial development or municipal disinvestment, like all these terms that underwrite everything from the poisoned water in Flint to the floods of raw sewage in Centerville to police violence uh, you know, against Floyd and Blake and all these other figures. That, and all the women, you know, black women and indigenous women who've been decimated and murdered in our cities as well. And so like, there's a story about the corridor about the industrial Midwest that I think doesn't get told when we pay attention to these coastal spaces or we think of Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco as being the sort of innovative sites of liberationist work on the one hand or also the sites of um, predatory racial capitalism. And so there is there is a story to be told about um, things that are happening in the central time zone that I wanna name for sure in our conversation. Thank you. That's exactly what I was hoping for. <laughs> Does, uh, who would like to, to pick it up next? I well, I, I, can, I can jump in a little bit. Oh, sorry, Mishana, do you wanna? No, okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just saying like, uh, and being so inspired by what our colleagues here on this panel are saying and reflecting back on this is like, I think that, uh, you know, there, there are always gonna be divisions. I, I think we don't expect all Helena, we don't expect all white people to, to agree on everything and move together at the same time. And I think that to expect that of BIPOC people is also uh, maybe an unfair imposition that we need to all get along constantly to, to still be moving in the same direction, which is the end of white supremacy and a more, um, uh, a more just society. And so I, I like for me, I'm, I'm ready for the BIPOC majority to do all the things that they wanna do. I, you know, I of course, uh, I take very seriously uh, what future Dr. Spillett <laughs> was saying about uh, needing to work against those clashes and ruptures that that you know don't don't help us get to the larger goal. I want more solidarity, but at the same time, I think that um, it's all good because we are all moving towards a a place that um, that will be more just in art history. And seeing the end of the supremacy of Western epistemology and bringing in, as Mashana was saying, the uh, all these new, uh, not new knowledges, but bringing new conversations into what is a very old way of thinking and doing things is it's so incredibly and critically inspiring to our work. Like in, in my own research, I worked through Inuit Hayumi Antikangi, which is our it's uh, anyway, traditional knowledge, value systems, ways of knowing, intergenerational knowledge, kind of everything holistically. Uh, packaged in together. And like she was saying, that's not when I when I do research into what it means to be an Inuk and like what those value systems are, they're not just for us. They're really they would make everyone better. <laughs> they would make all of society better if we were um, more respectful, if we understood our place as within the land instead of um, over the land or uh, separate from the land, if we could appreciate more uh, and treat children with more respect in the same way that we treat elders with more respect. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of knowledges that we have that we just need to bring them more fully into our, uh, into our discourse and into our pedagogy and into our practices in institutions and the public and the commons that I think will, um, are right now very excitingly shifting in a way uh, with a kind of rapidity that we haven't seen in a while, <laughs> you know, like maybe for indigenous peoples, maybe around the 1990s with the uh, 500th anniversary of Columbus uh, uh, arrival on uh, in North America, you know, there was a lot of critical movement then. And I think we're seeing a lot now in Canada, we're in the sort of post TRC era and the things that have changed in the last five years are more than have changed in the 25 years previous, you know, like the, the changes that I have seen in my own uh, institution at Concordia around Black Lives Matter from this summer 
is more than has happened in 50 years. So, you know, I, I, like, I think that we are in a moment and that there is a little bit of hope around uh, what BIPOC are doing together. I just want to follow up on that too, because um, I agree with what Tasha is saying there, that when things get raised, there becomes these like frictions and such, but I would recommend we don't shy away from those frictions in some way. We address them. Um, I was recently, um, part of an abolitionist panel in LA. And there are different, there are different opinions about abolishing the police, like that that come from different experiences and different uh, tribal situations, quite honestly. And um, I think if we don't listen to the critiques that each have of these movements, we lose the strength of that movement in and of itself. We have to listen to why would some people want police, right? And instead of demissing, cause you know, truth to, like I'm an abolitionist, I believe in that, but I also believe in listening to those uh, experience of women who have been sex trafficked, for instance, and why they can't get fully on board for abolitionists, right? And I think we have to listen. We have to listen to that side of the story. And then in terms of like, kind of, uh, I'm also part of another project that's just finished, Ronick is part of that too, um, finishing up on gender and sexuality studies. And one of the things that we worked so hard to do is not, not to roll it all into BIPIC, right? There's a danger with that, that you, if you roll everything into that one term, then you're losing the specificity. And I really feel specificity is strength in so many ways. I feel like myself as a Haudenosaunee woman and the, that's strength to me. Um, those philosophies can be shared as my students will tell you, I can get a little bit ethno-nationalist. They're like, yeah, yeah, you Haudenosaunee people. But, um, but at the same time, the specificity of what I, I view as the strength in some ways of native studies is that deep knowledge I think native studies gives other disciplines comes from the specificity of who we are in an understanding of that specificity. And um, like even in Los Angeles, things get wrapped up into these coasts, right? But there's a lot of difference in Los Angeles and LA and that difference actually helps to create those strong movements in other ways, right? If people stop and listening, listen to the differences in specificity, not collapse it under a biopic movement, but also I'm, and I'm a big believer in this. I, I know that doesn't surprise those of you who know that I do cultural geography kind of stuff, but the specificity of place in organizing, like, it, when you see Stacey Abrams organizing in Georgia, she's not organizing in the same way people are organizing in LA. So the only way that this organizing can also help is if there's a specificity to place. The only way I feel like I had to learn my place and place in Los Angeles to understand even how to do an effective community engaged project, for instance. Um, and I learn every day still on how to do that because this is not necessary. You know, I, I came as I came here as a, as a guest on Tomba Land. So I think there's a particular way we have to address those questions and those frictions in order to organize better and in order to see a more just future. For instance, you know, when we're talking about climate change, which this question was about, and we talk to specific places where the only economies are resource extraction, right? The only place people have to work, we have to think, what else can we give them as a source of income to feed their children? You know, that has healthcare, you know, these, these sorts of things. When we were addressing COVID, uh, I, I haven't seen it addressed yet, but my brother continues in the footsteps of my dad who is an iron worker in some ways, he's a millwright, but he, you know, everybody on his crew got COVID because they had to travel and they're traveling from all these different states. But what isn't addressed is the fact that if they don't show up for work, they lose their health insurance because they haven't worked a certain number of hours. So I think there's all these ways that specificity matters and the ways that these, these things matter in our organizing, that if we avoid the friction of these conversations, then we're not gonna be as strong in the solutions to the issues. Thanks so much. Um, I'm like learning so much from all of you, um, as well as Tasha, who had to leave. And, and I think that there's so many threads that I'm picking up from what all of you are saying um, in meaningful ways. 
um, I guess even just these last points that Mishana is bringing up that, that these contradictions or these conflicts have the potential to, to invigorate conversation and not avoid conversation, which is basically um, the strategy that, that I feel has been used by dominant groups to keep our groups um, not in collaboration, let's just say. Um, it, I, I, I see the, the sort of danger of turning away from those conversations. Um, I, I see it also because I know at least from my perspective um, as an Asian person, the way that this is totally a white strategy to create wedge groups of people and that, that creates a kind of antagonism where we aren't talking to one another and not identifying who has created those um, competitions, I guess, um, in those ways. Um, some of the things I guess I also heard in these conversations were are inspiring me to turn again to um, Joshua Whitehead's book that just came out in September, Love After the End, um, that is an anthology. So it's an edited collection of two-spirit and queer writers writing about writing in the genre of speculative fiction about how to create beauty, how to live in love after apocalypse. And, and what's so striking about the introduction to that collection is that um, Joshua begins by saying, you know, I'm writing this during COVID. Okay, but this is not a sort of singular event and we see the fingerprints and the echoes of other events that are not dissimilar here. And so, um, so I mean, I'm just inspired. I heard from um, Heather this idea and also from Ronak this, this idea of turning to um, different kinds of cultural productions to think through like what we can do in these moments of conflict and contradiction and, um, and grief, I think. And, and I hope that like beauty and love is the direction, but I don't know. I mean, I hope that's our future because that's our, that's kind of the next question too, right? So I think that, you know, what, I, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm an eternal optimist, so I guess maybe I, I, I only see it that way, but I, I definitely, I, you know, I think that what each person is trying to articulate is that there is tension and contradiction in that kind of alliances and just what, you know, Jenny just said, it's like, you know, it's a specific kind of project that, that people want us to be dismantled or not united or not have conversations or not spark uh, friction or contradiction. And I think that, and in fact, that's where all the really good work happens. Like I think about, you know, all of my own uh, practices and uh, projects, you know, I come home a little bit frustrated or a little bit grumps. And then I realize I'm like, oh, there's something like that sparked this is actually become this. And I know that, you know, even a lot of work within institutional spaces, you know, whether that be uh, a gallery or a university or an organization that wants you to do X or, you know, check the box. And I think that at the end of the day, it's like even those small um, conversations, which are usually tense and um, always uh, 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 friction based, <laughs> you know, that, you know, sometimes some of the most beautiful things happen. And I think that one of the really great examples is where um, Heather's going to get to open up the uh, inaugural exhibition. And, you know, we, we would be in a very different place, you know, six years ago, had we not started that conversation and, and been at the forefront of with the Winnipeg Art Gallery in building the first ever Inuit Art Center in that in that capacity, would it would it would there have been Indigenous names named in that space, you know, would there be all of the folks that work there that do an incredible job, you know, I think that things could look very different and and that's not to say that there isn't sparks and friction and <laughs> contradictions because that's that's part of the job I feel like um my final question because we only got a little bit left of time and uh you know I can sit and listen to you guys all the time especially if we were having glasses of wine I um I want you guys to talk a little bit of, to reflect on the importance of uh black and indigenous and people of color creating spaces uh for acts of alliances kind of what you're what you're talking about and then how that might bring us into the future or is linked to our kind of climate that we're experiencing right now and i know that you guys are already touching on it but just kind of some final thoughts on it
I'm struck by your use of the word climate in the questions, Julie, because, you know, I think some people interpret it as like, oh, you mean like climate change or like atmospheric politics or like climate, like what's hanging around, what's going on here, you know, and, and you know, back to Mashana about the question about place and specificity, I think is something um, to name. I, I wanted to, if I could, I know you're an eternal optimist and I, you know, I'm utopian oriented too. And I, I, I think like part of what we're saying here is that even the best forms of organizing and whether that's community engaged work or praxis or feminist and queer and trends of color organizing is speculative, right? Like it's, it's prefigurative. It means like we're practicing in the here and now about how we want to live after the apocalypse. Like that's precisely why we turn to all of this amazing art and organizing and activism and stuff. But then I was thinking about this discussion about specificity and it reminded me that we all are circulating in these neoliberal institutions, whether those are museum and art gallery spaces or our academic institutions that have a very different notion of what it means to incorporate difference and you know, flatten out those specificities in ways that are really quite violent and ferocious. And I mean, I think we are certainly experiencing, Heather, you mentioned that Concordia is doing more, I imagine more hiring or more attention to you know, black, black faculty and black studies than it has in many decades. And I think you know, that's something curious to pay attention to is like after the, you know, the riots and rebellion of the summer, um, the kinds of responses of our institutions to, to hire certain prominent visible figures and not do the downwardly redistributive work of really, really supporting black studies or really supporting native studies on our campus. And of course, we're all, we're all, in, we're all knowledge workers and in, in, in these institutions fighting our institutions to do that kind of redistributive work. But it just reminded me that the specificity that Mashana is naming that is so important, not only to our pedagogy, but to the kind of movement praxis into, you know, organizing work is often lost on, on institutions who are not able, who, you know, who are not able to, for whom that difference is not even legible. And I just, I wonder what people, how people are grappling with that, because I think it's something that for those of us who want to um, make more space for BIPOCs to do the kind of prefigurative abolitionist creative emergent work that we're all talking about, um, we have to we have to own up to the fact that that part of the violence is the way that that gets misread or misrecognized by um, institutions. Sorry, well, I think you were to say. Well, I'll just jump in to say that it's actually not just the hiring of black faculty, and yeah. that's that's what's so remarkable about this instance. And I think it follows our Indigenous Directions Leadership Council, which was started a couple of years ago and started doing all this work. But by the, the Black community of Concordia, they uh, organized this summer and demanded change from the institution. And the institution, I think, to their credit, uh, didn't resist and was actually very supportive and formed the Black Perspectives Office, which is from the top down as well as from the bottom up uh, working on, um, so that's like a an office of the provost now working on initiatives across the university led by some really phenomenal people who are supporting uh, our, our graduate students, our undergrad students, the staff, the faculty, I'm going to post a link in the conversation. So I'm not, I'm not saying that you're wrong. <laughs> like there's tons and tons of work to do, but it's actually not just uh, the hiring of people. It's not just uh, bodies in the space, but it actually is an initiative that's trying to change, which is, which is why it's so critical because previously, you know, you'd do a cluster hire and that would be the kind of end of it. And then all those faculty would be floating off on their own and in their individual <laughs> Uh, departments and this is really trying to uh, build a different sort of solidarity and we've actually we've had a little bit of a um, not clashes but we have had some uh, concerns about like diverting energies away from indigenous initiatives and towards uh, black initiatives and vice versa and so we are also still working through like how we're going to collectivize this and not and have those critical conversations so that we can be uh, in support of one another at a time when, you know, because of COVID, we're talking about an economic crisis that's going to get worse, even as we collectively get better. I have so much to say here and stuff I probably shouldn't say here. Um, <laughs> but I do feel to me the way that I work with my colleagues at UCLA in this particular institution where we have very strong uh, relationships is to have conversations outside of 
meetings <laughs> or prep before the meeting. I work with the Black feminist scholars on campus. I work with the Latinx scholars and we support each other. Not everybody, I mean, there's still tensions there as the Chronicle of Higher Ed probably showed, but um, there's, a, there's still a lot of tension there. But going in, knowing that you have a common goal helps, even though you, you know, there's different ways that we all need to have stuff accomplished. But I, I do have to say, to me, that's the strength of any fighting any neoliberal institution is working outside of it on the parameters and finding people that you can talk to, even if you might not agree or disagree at, at times. And um, but at least having that conversation with those people, I think I think the university wants to keep us in a kind of uh, four food group model so that we don't talk to each other. The biggest thing we can do to fight neoliberalism in the university is to absolutely refuse that four food group models. When there's black, when there's a black feminist scholar, particularly because that's where I'm at. But um, or yeah, no, that's not true. Anywhere across the university, I will su support those job talks. I will support my my colleagues. So it's also showing up when it matters to other people as well. Um, I, I feel like in the neoliberal university, they really want to keep that four food groups model, which is problematic. Um, yeah, I think this is a perfect example, this conversation about how to um, exist within our institutions of what Mishana was saying in terms of the importance of specificity, um, but then also the coming together um, in meaningful ways with that specificity in mind, because there's power in that specificity and that sort of um, representing a different community and saying, but still, like we're here together for this particular issue. Um, it's, it's when um, those specificities are dissolved that the institutions will try to gaslight you and say, well, if you want this diversity piece or if you want this rights piece, then you're taking away from this other group, right? So um, I should probably stop speaking about this too right now. Um, but all that to say, this is um, this is something that I think a lot of people from our various marginalized communities already know intuitively, and that is how to balance um, be the the power that comes with representing um, one's self, but then also how to um, galvanize and how to harness that position to um, be there for your um, for your siblings, for your kin, for your people. Yeah, I just want to say that, um, you know, just to kind of add more bits and pieces, but I just think like, you know, even with the optimism, you know, there's still real kickback. And I'd say that, you know, even with Nui Blanche, you know, we launched, uh, I think, 55 or 56 artists, and the entire roster was BIPOC. And uh, one of the, some of the feedback was that I didn't select big enough named artists. And so for me, that's a real like undercut in terms of thinking about, you know, the kind of racialized conversations and the violence towards or the opportunities lack there of opportunities for those artists. And I think that, you know, that becomes in itself a whole other battle that different people take on. And I think it it you, each person and I'm I, I would you know hazard to guess that each of you have been dealing with that in different aspects of the work that you're doing. Uh, the other thing I would say is that you know here at the University of Winnipeg, you know with um, we were able to get a designated hire, which is not um, you know apparently is not a small feat. And so I think that especially within our history and our history department, you know, was a big deal to kind of push through those uh, boundaries because just what Jenny's saying is like, well, if you say this, then you could potentially have a failed search because there's also the myth that those faculty members don't exist or that those opportunities aren't there or that, you know, that we can't draw in those people. And I think that, you know, each person that becomes in those kind of leadership roles continues that kind of really hard work and just what Mashana's saying, it's like, and then you create those alliances and you start working together and you communicate, you know, group chat, or you have a conversation before you go into that meeting, or you guys are, you know, some of you are special advisors to provost. So, you know, you sit in those conversations and you figure out, you know, how do we mobilize uh, our group of people to like be able to do this really good critical work without leaving people alone. Because I think for the longest time in, in faculty positions or in institutions, like you're all alone by yourself, 
continuing to have those same conversations, asking those hard questions, you know, or people um, constantly contradicting or talking over you because they think that your opinion and your um, presence isn't valued. And so I think that, you know, I think that that's one of the most radical things as we move forward, the more we communicate, the more kind of friction that happens and those dialogues is where like that real rich opportunity comes from. So we have a few minutes. If you guys want any closing uh, thought, you can go to it. Yeah. You got to turn your sound on. I think Michelle is trying to talk. <laughs> Sorry, I was going back between screens and it wasn't working. Uh, just on that, uh, right now there's a day of action and I'm gonna put it in, in, the, in the thing and it's for um, Bring Blue Sky Home who is a, um, a, a Native American transgender man from the Coeur d'Alene uh, tribe who's been incarcerated for 37 years. And today's the day of action. So I had to look it up real quick, but I'm gonna put it in there. And if anybody wants to support or do alliance for this days of action, it would be, it would be really uh, wonderful. And this is being, um, day of action is being done through the Center for Study of Women at UCLA. So I'll try to put it in the corner over here and see if it, well, hold on. So I'll put it there, but I just wanted to put that out there. Well, I'm not going to force you guys to talk. I know you've been talking the whole time. So I just like, I'm, I'm just like, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure you guys have a space to have any kind of closing remarks. But at the same time, I want to say Chi Mingwichi and Marcy and thank you for your good minds and good hearts and your virtual box presence uh, in our in our realm. And uh, I know that Lorena might come back on to, uh, to close us out, but I, I do want to thank you from the bottom of my heart that uh, I really appreciate your time and energy and voices here at the table. And I can't thank you enough. Nakami, Julie, Taima. Great. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I just I just want to say that I I really enjoyed today's panel. It allowed me um, to think through a lot of difficult questions. I think that we're all grappling with as academics during this um, this challenging and interesting time. But it's also um, usually during the Way We Need Lecture series, we have one speaker. And um, because of the pandemic, we have the opportunity to bring a panel like this together. And so to have a US Canadian perspective, but also from various universities, I found um, the discussion today very thought provoking and uh, has made me a lot, think a lot about uh, the work that I do um, here in Winnipeg. So thank you so much for, um, for taking the time to be with us today. And you will be receiving a little, uh, a little love package from the University of Winnipeg um, <laughs> over the next couple of weeks. And uh, I just want to, um, to wish you all well um, and keep, uh, keep doing the amazing work that you're doing. And I'll be watching you from afar. <laughs>